welcome to another episode of Your Business Unleashed, a uh, podcast for entrepreneurs uh, to help them get off the treadmill and, and build a life uh, build a life that they want to have. Today, we have a wonderful guest, uh, Maria Soledad de Bilbao. Am I saying that correctly? Yes, you did. We have been friends for, <laughs> oh boy, like 15 years or something, maybe nearly 20 <laughs> We met in university way back when, and Maria owns uh, is a serial entrepreneur, I would say. She owns a few businesses uh, from uh, Tango for the Soul Dance dance Instruction, as well as uh, Maria Soledad Coaching. Thank you so much for being with us today, Maria. Thank you for having me. So I like to start at the beginning. I like to start at um, sort of where the journey began, and, and I think that you have a really, really cool story uh, for um, for entrepreneurs out there. And what, so why don't we go back to when we met in university and sort of where maybe even before that and how you decided to come to Canada? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I came to Canada without speaking the language. I decided that I needed to learn English. I was 21. Uh, and I hop on a plane <laughs> and I got to left pressure. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I did, uh, a program ESL uh, for six months, and then I started university uh, under a kinesiology degree, and that's when I met you, uh, and a whole lot of friends that I still have uh, from back then. Um, and I completed a degree in kinesiology, and then after that, with honors, um, I wrote a, a thesis, and then I went on completing a master's degree in dance at York University, um, and that's how dance company started. I teach Argentine tango to adults and I did for a little bit, it was the artist in residency for um, the Board of Education schools. Um, and once I had children, um, I kind of decided to drop that and then focus more on the adult side of things. Um, I organized festivals um, for the tango community here in Calgary um, and I hold uh, classes weekly. That's the one side of my entrepreneurship. The other side of my entrepreneurship is uh, almost four years ago, I got into coaching. I started with life coaching and then the path led me to become a certified EF coach and uh, ADHD coach. Awesome. So, I, I mean, I could have guessed probably from right when we met, you know, when, when we met, uh, you were going, this is this is a person who came here from a different country who barely spoke the language when she arrived fought her way down to Lethbridge of all places to go to school, um, learned English in six months, and then ended up a few years later getting honors. Um, and I think, did you get a scholarship in Toronto? You know, so... Uh, yes, I yeah. got a scholarship at the end of uh, my undergraduate degree. Uh, and then I got a, scho a full scholarship for the master's degree, yes. I mean, it sounds kind of nice when you're summing it all up at the end, uh, you know, or, well, we're not at the end. We're only we're only part of the way through. But yeah. there's a lot of struggle through that. Right. And yeah. so that's where I could have, you know, I'm going, this person's an entrepreneur. We're we're sort of uh, kindred spirits here, I would say. And, and I knew that of you right away uh, just mm -hmm. from your fight. Right. Uh, me, I was working. I was running stores full time while attending university, yeah. I think, when we met. And and I think that's that's sort of how our connection went is maybe maybe we both had a tremendous amount of adversity that we were facing or that maybe we mm -hmm. craved it. I'm not sure, but we, we fought through it. Right. And, and now, you know, sort of a little bit through the journey, a lot of journey left, but if you look back and reflect, it's like, wow, that, that was a pretty good ride. Right. Yes. That and it's was. the same. It's the same with entrepreneurship, <laughs> isn't it? Right? So. Yes. Yes. And I think that that's one of the things that sort of like draw me to the friendship with you, Clay, is that out of all of my friends um, in university, you were one of the few that are actually holding a full time job while going to school. Uh, mm. Because for me to go to school, I also had to do that as an international student. I had to pay international fees, which normally are double than what Canadians paid. And so I didn't have parents that had the means to actually pay for my my studying. So I had to do it on my own. And I had so much money that I saved back in Argentina. And that wasn't enough to put me through four years of school. So I had to work. And I did. I, I There was times that I worked up to three jobs to be able to actually um, pay for my studies. And like most Canadians, they take the summer off. I didn't. I worked through my yeah. summers. Yeah, and I actually I. did school through my summers because I couldn't take more than three courses at a time because it was too much money. So I made it up during the summer. So I was never behind, but I was always in school and I was always working. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> right on. Um, <laughs> it is crazy to think about. It is crazy to think about. And so how did you know... 
I mean, it must have been in it must have been at U of T when you were doing your master's of dance that you decided you wanted to make money from this. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I completed my master's degree. And then I in the meantime, I met my husband um, and my husband lived in Edmonton and then he moved to Calgary. Um, and so then I was I was in in Toronto and he was in Calgary and he asked me to marry him. And so I actually ended up finishing my master's degree here in Calgary. Um, oh. the writing portion of it. Yeah. Okay. I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. And that's um and that's kind of when I when I started uh teaching. And I actually out of everything, I actually started teaching private lessons, not group lessons. <laughs> uh people would just see me dancing and they would just ask me uh to come and uh do a couple of private lessons. And then from them it from, from that it grew like I put a couple of like workshops and then from that grew you know, group lessons for X amount of weeks. And then from that, uh, one very good friend of mine, um, Kate McKenzie, uh, was a teacher at that time. And she asked me to come and do some stuff for her kids. And so I ended up actually coming back for several years to that particular school, being the artist in residency and teaching children how to dance um, and doing special projects with the older kids. Uh, we are, we even had like the mayor coming in um, and actually watching Nanji. Uh, he came in and watched one of the performances that we put together. So that was that was a very a highlight of my career, sort of working with children and helping them to express themselves. That's really neat. Um, and and you know your husband's an entrepreneur as well. Uh, yes, so I mean, you've got, you, it's a whole family <laughs> of entrepreneurs in your house. So there's a lot of different businesses going on in your house. Yes. And, uh, you know, how tell us a little bit about, um, uh, you know, about the, the struggles with that and how you overcame them or how you're overcoming them still. I imagine it's still ongoing. Oh, yes. Right? So. <laughs> yes. So um, it is not easy. I am going to say it. So if you if you are if you are working and you are thinking to go into entrepreneurship, it is not it is not an easy transition. It has a lot of highlights. But it also has a lot of lows. Um, you know, I I I became a full entrepreneur. I want to say three years ago when I stopped working for the city of Calgary uh, because all along I was an entrepreneur, but I also held also a full time job. And three years ago, I just let go of that and I became a full entrepreneur. But um, it, it is it is a struggle, you know, and sort of like getting out and finding clients. And, and sort of like finding this, these places where you find your rhythm, right? Because I feel that entrepreneurship is, you have really highs and you have really lows and sort of like finding a sense of stability, uh, which my husband has done really well. Uh, and I am still sort of like traveling through that stage where, where I do have really highs and really lows at times, especially having two companies, right? Um, I, I think that's where my challenge uh, lies half the time, having just two companies. Yeah, right on. And so tell me a little bit about um, tell me a little bit about because you've shifted in and out of like you, you've done this for the city a little bit. And tell us how that sort of came into the journey. Yeah, so I finished my master's degree um, and I was teaching dance uh, and then an opportunity came to work for the city of Calgary as a recreation program specialist. So I led uh, one of the facilities here in Calgary for uh, the better of 13 years. And uh, I led a team of about 50 employees and run everything related to fitness and wellness and yoga and children's programming. I had a wonderful team. Um, and then COVID happened and then things shifted and changed. <laughs> but that yeah. gave me a big understanding of sort of like what, what people needed and wanted um, um, from the perspective of like that wellness and that fitness. Yeah. Yeah, right on. And and to do with wellness now, the the move in the last few years has been to get into life coaching. And I think, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think that relates in part to the adversity that you faced or were facing and some of the specific challenges that you were facing. And, um, you know, some really good things came out of that in terms of where you wanted to head with your career. So tell us a little bit about that. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um... So I mean, like working for the city was was wonderful uh, and it allowed me to sort of create wonderful relationships and seeing, you know, what people really needed. 
but there's so much that one can do just in that environment. And I felt yeah. that there was a need for more um, within the wellness realm uh, to really dive a little bit deeper into into what it is to sort of like live a life where you actually thrive uh, instead of sort of bringing your boat slowly and feeling that you're not sort of like moving to that to that other end. Right. So that's kind of where I strive to help people you know, in my coaching uh, practice to sort of um, live a life that with no restrictions, if you want to call it. Yeah. We were doing a lot of mountain biking at the time, yes. um, <laughs> you know, and, and being outside and finding ways to find mm-hmm. peace in our, in our worlds. Right. And, yeah. Um, and so tell us a little bit about the life coaching. Yeah. So I started my journey with the human potential Academy um, as a human potential coach would involves you know, like health and wellness and performance. Yeah. Um, and from there, just from the conversations that I had uh, with uh, some of my classmates, uh, the the word executive coaching and ADHD came to um, my world. And I was like, okay, what is that? Uh, and it kind of like perked my ears. Uh, and the reason why is because we live with neurodiversity in our household. And so I got really interested and sort of led me through a journey of of going to putting myself through school for for about a year and a half and and becoming a certified ADHD coach. Uh, and my focus uh, today is more onto that ADHD world. Yeah. Um, working, my specialty is working with children, but I also work with adults. I run um, adult ADHD coaching through uh, Fox and Associates, so a psychological practice. I do one to one sessions. I do presentations. Uh, and I try my best to advocate as much as I, I can for the condition. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how the coaching, you know, so somebody who has ADHD, what are you doing specifically to help them? And I, I realize that that's probably a, a tricky question to answer because I imagine everybody's got a specific set of circumstances. But why don't you talk about the condition a little bit and the ways that you can help? Yeah, so for me, it's it's a bit of a journey. Um, you know, some people come to me knowing a lot about ADHD, and some people come to me really not knowing a whole lot of it. Uh, and so there is a big psychoeducational component to what I do. Um, yeah. And and certainly when engaged with me in a group uh, coaching session, there's there's um, different modules that we go through, and 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 there's that learning, but there's also that that the discussion and sort of learning that you're not alone, and that there's a lot of people that actually go through the same things. A lot um, of education at the front end, yeah. A lot of education at the front, and and then we help, or I help clients to sort of develop uh, strategies, develop a lot of self compassion and empathy towards themselves, or if they're not themselves, but they are, you know. Um, a spouse or or a child sort of learning what is it like to actually step in the shoes of a person with ADHD uh, because mm-hmm. there's an invisible part of of the condition that most people don't actually don't get to see uh, they see a normal person but the perception of the world is very different okay. uh, their their neurochemistry is very different uh, right and so um ADHD is considered a, a developmental disorder, and but it's invisible. And so most people actually don't see the struggle. Um, and so yeah. and so I help my clients to sort of come to terms with the fact that they are different and uh, not to try to fit into a box because they certainly, neurodiverse uh, people don't fit into a box. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. if they do, they actually uh, begin to cre- uh, create a lot of damage uh, to to themselves and to others. Interesting. So what would be some of the what would be some of the main indicator? I mean, maybe somebody who has ADHD that doesn't know or isn't on the radar that they have ADHD is has come stumbled across this podcast. And so mm-hmm. what would be some of the indicators that, you know, maybe maybe you need to have a look at this? What are some of the things? Yeah. So, you know, um, usually people with ADHD struggle with executive functions and executive functions is that part of your front load. So I always call it sort of like the motherboard of your computer, right? And so it's it's really what, um, you know, skills that help you to sort of um, or get organized, manage your time, uh, curve impulses, pursue, you know, like academic goals or pursue a career, you know, things like that, that it, it's always with, with, a, with a goal in mind. And yeah. sort of when you, when you have trouble accessing your executive functions, then it's really hard to to sort of do things um, of daily living. Uh, and so it comes into the symptoms of, you know, 
what most people uh, might uh, equate ADHD to would be hyperactivity and a bit of a lack of, of focus, right? But that's just the beginning. There's so much more to the condition, right? Yeah. Um, and so really it is important if you're feeling, you know, like that there's something that is off. Um, it's really important to actually get officially diagnosed um, mm -hmm. either by by a physician or a psychologist uh, and to truly really begin to understand who you are. And, and, you know, in my practice, I focus on strength and positive psychology. And so really with the clients, we try to uh, really work on what are the best, you know, traits that you bring to the table. Um, and then from there, seeing what are some of the skills that need to be scaffolded um, yeah. and just help you to, to live a life where you can thrive. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. And recently you did a, you did a blog post for us. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I asked you to do it and I really appreciate you doing it because you've had some experience getting uh, certain folks, not everybody, but certain folks who have diagnosed ADHD that meet a certain set of criteria to get a, and this is where it stepped into my word is world is to get approved for the disability tax credit, which is a really great that's a lot of money, right? When you can get approved for that, if you are eligible for it, that's a lot of money that you can save on your taxes, right? So tell us a little bit that's about right. that. Yeah. Um, so my son has ADHD and um, it comes in our family. It, it moves from, um, you know, grandpa to ev everyone. Um, so anyway, so uh, we knew that our son had ADHD very early on his life. Yeah. Um, and uh Last year, in 2022, we decided to actually get, 2021, we got an official diagnosis. And the reason why I did this is because we were struggling at school. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, schools can't provide you with modifications unless you actually have an IPP, so an educational plan. And to be able to have an educational plan, you need to have an official um, diagnosis. So we went to a pediatrician and we got diagnosed. Um, and as I go more and more into my career and studying about ADHD, I, I begin to understand the power of having a psychoeducational assessment. So I reached out to the psychological practice I work for, and one of the psychologists there uh, did a psychoeducational assessment for us. And what yielded out of that is for us as parents to learn a little bit more uh, what executive functions are that our, our son struggles with a lot. But also we learned that he is actually gifted. Uh, and the term, uh, for those that are not familiar, that is called 2E, so twice exceptional. Uh, twice exceptional, meaning that you are gifted, but you also have a disability. And ADHD is considered a disability, and most people actually don't know this. Because we have I, I didn't functions. know that. Yeah. I didn't know so, that until a couple, you know, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, so because it is, the, your executive functions are being compromised, right? And so, so anyway, so we got the psychoeducational assessment and then chatting uh, with one of my coworkers, um, she... Uh, revealed to me that she has a child with a disability. And she's like, I was telling her about the psychoeducational assessment. She's like, I think you should apply for um, the disability tax credit. And um, it was a journey, <laughs> to say the least, um, because I didn't really understand it. So I started sort of chatting with a lot of um, institutions that help you sort of like fill paperwork. I spoke with the psychologist that did the psychoeducational assessment for us. And I said, like, would you be willing to actually fill this out? Um, and she did. So I began to educate myself onto what is it that I need? Um, how do I, I, I should be filling the form uh, to actually get approved for it? Uh, because certainly we, we do have a bit of a struggle. And anyway, so that's how we, it came to be. It took me a bunch of months to actually come to complete it. And then I send it and I forgot about it until recently. <laughs> As you do when you send something to the CRA and it takes months and yes. months and months to come back. Yeah. In like, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, so anyway, so, so yeah, so we got approved uh, as a, nice. as a disability tax credit. Yeah. And, and we published a blog. And so I yes. think, you know, a really, a really key takeaway here is, I mean, I just, I, well, maybe I think it's so interesting that your, mm -hmm your all of your entrepreneurial um journey you're you're seeking to i think help people and whether it's through yes. dance which has a you know a huge amount of physical and mental um wellness benefits to it um and you've always you've always believed in that and you've managed to turn that into a career which is amazing um mm -hmm. and now into this life coaching that relates to your personal experiences and how to help people understand 
um, understand what they're dealing with when maybe they couldn't otherwise understand it. And I'm, I'm just, I'm totally inspired by that. And I think it's amazing. I do taxes, so I'm not even close, right? It's just <laughs> people, people who have the drive that you do to help other people is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have you as a friend and I, I appreciate knowing you. So, um, you, so anybody who's dealing, it. yeah, thank you. Anybody who's dealing with ADHD, um, there's really good alternatives to um, to get some help out there and to understand what you're dealing with and to maybe get some access to government benefits and to start living mm -hmm. your life better, right? So, That's um, right. yeah. So for I usually do a top three at the end of these things mm -hmm. where I say, listen, if somebody's considering becoming an entrepreneur, what are the three tips that you would give them? <laughs> so I would just say number one, it's like, be be ready for the ups and downs <laughs> yeah because they yeah. are going to be there um you know as you get more and more into your entrepreneurship you know journey they might become less of those downs and more of like that constant uh, but just be ready for those up and downs i think my second one would be just to be open to things that are happening around you and helping yourself to reframe um, where, where you're at just by checking in with yourself daily, um, and mm -hmm. making sure that you check in with your, with your strengths, right. Uh, from a, from a strength uh, perspective that you're really, it's easy to forget when you're in the downs that you have a lot of strengths. And so just reminding yourself that those strengths are there and that my, well, there might be a low, um, those strengths will bring you back up. And then my third one, um, I don't know. Keep it positive um, because becoming an entrepreneur is wanting to add to this world in a very different way, in a way that not everybody is thinking in that way. Uh, yeah. And most likely the, you, you are the only one or the few ones that are thinking that way. Uh, and so keep in reminding yourself that you're here to make a difference. Right on. Mm -hmm. um, Maria Soledad de Bilbao, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, and uh, and making the time for us thank you for inviting me i appreciate it mm -hmm.